Good evening, yes, friends. Welcome to Daily Newspaper Analysis brought to you by Shankara Yes Academy. Today's date is 21st November 2024. Displayed here are the list of topics that we are going to discuss today. The first topic is about the impact of climate change on aquaculture. The second topic is about the GM crops in India and what are the advantages and disadvantages of GM crops. The third topic is about the maritime security and initiatives of India for maritime security. The fourth topic is about the coffee board and some basics about the coffee crop and coffee production in India. So these are the four important topics we are going to discuss in this video. Now before the discussion, this is an important announcement. pre storming prelims to series batch 3 is starting on 21st November. So interested aspirants can enroll in it. Another initiative of Sankarayas Academy, Chakra for current affairs. Interested aspirants can also check it in the link given in the description. Now let us get into the discussion. Now look at this article. The Food and Agricultural Organization has said that climate change is the biggest disruptor of aquaculture. So in this context, let us discuss what are the impacts of climate change on aquaculture. We can also discuss about the basics of FAO. Now let us get into the discussion. Food and Agricultural Organization is a specialized agency of United Nations. It was established in 1945 with a mission to combat hunger and promote the sustainable agriculture worldwide. It is headquartered in Rome. International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture, which is also known as the Seed Plant Treaty, is an important treaty of this organization. This Seed Plant Treaty focuses on preserving plant genetic resources for food security. So, this is about the basic information regarding Food and Agricultural Organization. Now, let us see the structure of FAO. The governance of FAO is carried out through several key bodies. The conference is a supreme decision making body which includes all member nations. The conference meets every two years to decide priorities and approve the budgets. The council of FAO acts as the executive arm. The council manages the program implementation and policy development and it has representatives who are elected for three year terms. An important thing to note here is that the decisions made in the conference are binding on all the member countries and the representatives for the council are elected for every three years. So, the conference is the supreme decision making body of FAO. Now, there are several committees functioning under FAO, Program Committee, Finance Committee, Committee on Commodity Problems, Committee on World Food Security, Committee on Agriculture and Fisheries. So, these are some of the important committees under FAO. FAO is headed by Director General and he is elected by the member states for four years. So, the Director General oversees the day to day operations and implementation of policies. So, this is about the structure of FAO. Now, let us see some key initiatives of FAO. The World Food Day which is on October 16. This is to raise awareness about the global hunger. FAO has also devised a strategic framework 2022 to 2031 and it focuses on transforming the food system to align with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. FAO also collaborates with WHO to develop Codex Alimentaris. This is a code for international food safety and quality standards. So, this Codex Alimentaris is a joint development of WHO and FAO. The World Food Day, FAO Strategic Framework and Codex Alimentaris, these are some of the important initiatives of FAO. Now, let us discuss about the impact of climate change on aquaculture. As we have seen in the news article, the climate change is a major disruptor of aquaculture and let us see what are the impacts. The first one is rising water temperature. See, increasing water temperature increases the stress on fishes and other aquatic species. So, this will slow their growth and make them more vulnerable to diseases and parasites. Also, the ocean acidification weakens the shells of molluscus like oysters and clams and it also disturbs the plankton species which is crucial for aquatic food chain. So, increasing acidity of ocean is also disrupting the food chain of oceans. The next one is extreme weather events. Extreme weather events like storms and hurricanes can damage the aquaculture infrastructure. So, this poses severe economic challenges. The rising sea level also affects the coastal forms by flooding and increases the soil salinity and threatens the natural breeding grounds. So, the rising sea level may also threaten the mangroves and coastal wetlands. In addition to this, the water quality also deteriorates due to phenomena like eutrophication and hypoxia. So, eutrophication can harm the fish health and productivity in both marine and freshwater environments. So, these are some of the impacts of climate change on aquaculture. Now, let us discuss a prelims practice question regarding this topic. Codex Alimentaris is an internationally recognized standards and guidelines to ensure food safety and security. Yes, this statement is correct. It is a joint initiative of FAO and WTO. This is an incorrect statement because it is a joint initiative of FAO 
and World Health Organization. Here the question is asked about the incorrect statement. So, the correct answer is option B, 2 only. With this, let us conclude the discussion and move to the next news article. Look at this article. The Coffee Board of India has created a 10-year roadmap to target the coffee production in India and doubling it in next 10 years. So, in this context, let us discuss about the basics of the coffee crop and the coffee production in India and we shall also discuss about the coffee board. Now, let us get into the discussion. So, India ranks at 6th largest producer in coffee production and 4th largest exporter of coffee. The coffee cultivation in India has an interesting history. It was introduced in 17th century by Baba Budan in Chikmangaluru region of Karnataka. So, the India's coffee production is primarily concentrated in 3 states. Karnataka which accounts for 70% of total production, Kerala accounts for 20% of production and Tamil Nadu contributes for 5% of total production. So, Karnataka, Kerala, Tamil Nadu are the three important states of coffee production in India. Smaller and significant coffee cultivation also happens in Andhra Pradesh, Odisha, Maharashtra and Assam. There are two important varieties of coffee in India. One is Arabica and other one is Robusta. Arabica is known for high quality of coffee. It is grown at higher altitude and it is more vulnerable to pest. If you look at Robusta, it has a strong flavor and it is more disease resistant compared to Arabica. It is grown at lower altitudes with a higher productivity. So, the productivity of Robusta is higher than Arabica, but when it comes to quality, Arabica is better than Robusta. Coffee requires a temperate climate and a moderate rainfall. Rainfall of around 1500 to 2500 mm is suitable for coffee cultivation. The soil should be slightly acidic and fertile soil with a good drainage system is essential for coffee growth. Coffee is often grown under the shade to protect it from direct sunlight. Coffee is a perennial crop with economic life of about 30 to 40 years. The flowering season of coffee is from October to November and the harvesting takes place between January and March. So, this is a cropping cycle of coffee. As we have discussed the basics about coffee, now let us discuss about the Coffee Board of India. The Coffee Board is a statutory body functioning under the Ministry of Commerce and Industry. It is established in 1942 under Coffee Act of 1942. The headquarters of Coffee Board is at Bengaluru. Some important functions of Coffee Board are research and development, quality control and farmer support. So, the Coffee Board also helps farmers with the financial aid, pest management and also helps in the formation of farmer producer organization that is FPOs. Additionally, the Coffee Board promotes the coffee both in domestic and international market. So, these are some of the functions of Coffee Board. India exports about 70% of coffee production. The largest importer of India's coffee were Italy, Germany and Belgium. The monsoon to Malabar coffee, which is a GI tagged product, is particularly popular in overseas. Emerging markets like China, South Korea and Middle East are also gaining importance for India's coffee. In 2021 to 2022, India produced approximately 3.98 lakh metric tons of coffee. Karnataka is a leading producer of coffee in India, which contributes about 70% of total production. As we have seen, there are two varieties of coffee, Arabica and Robusta. The productivity of Robusta is higher than Arabica. The government has created several initiatives to support the coffee farmers. Coffee Development Program, which provides financial aid for improving the plantations. Then Technology Mission on Coffee, it focuses on pest control, better planting materials and advanced post-harvest techniques. MSP is also issued for coffee. It is to shield farmers from price fluctuations. There are unique coffee varieties which are given the geographical indication tag that is the coffee with GI tags. Monsoon to Malabar Arabica and Robusta which is grown in Karnataka and Kerala, Kurg Arabica and Baba Budan Giri Arabica and Chikmangaluru Arabica. These varieties are grown in Karnataka. Vayanad Robusta. This is grown in Kerala. So, these varieties of coffee are given geographical indication tag. So, this is all about the discussion. Let us discuss a prelims practice question. India's coffee board, which is recently seen in the news for its 10 year roadmap, operates under which ministry? As we have seen in the discussion, it operates under Ministry of Commerce and Industry. So, with this, let us conclude the discussion and move to the next news article. Look at this article. Prime Minister Modi has highlighted India's advancement in maritime infrastructure. He said that the initiatives in port modernization, shipbuilding and efforts to ensure a secure and sustainable maritime efforts to ensure a secure and sustainable maritime environment by 2047. So in this context let us discuss about the port modernization in India and what are the important initiatives regarding it. 
Firstly about the capacity expansion. India has recently improved the port infrastructure with a total capacity of 2650 million tons per annum. This is a doubling of capacity in last 10 years. In the financial year 2023 to 2024, major ports handled a record breaking of 1520 million metric tons of cargo. The government is implementing the Sagar Mala program. It focuses on modernizing over 500 projects by 2035. So this include developing mega ports to handle increasing trade volume. Next about the efficiency improvements. The major ports of India have become more efficient in recent years. The average time a ship spends at the port has decreased from 96 hours in 2014 to just 26 hours in 2023. So there is a decrease in average time a ship spends at a port. In addition to this, advanced technologies are also used in port handling. Radio frequency identification that is RFID for tracking the shipments, automated berthing system to streamline the docking and e-clearance system for faster cargo processing. So these are some of the advanced technologies which are implemented in ports. A digital platform called Port Community System has been introduced to integrate all stakeholders. This include customs, shipping companies and transporters and they are integrated into one seamless system. So this is the Port Community System and it is a digital platform to integrate all these stakeholders. Next about the connectivity enhancement. Highways and expressways, especially six lane expressways, which is constructed under Bharat Mala Pariyojana, are connecting major ports to the industrial hubs. Dedicated freight corridors, which are the rail links, are being expanded to improve the rail transport between the ports and the markets. So this allows for faster and more efficient cargo movement. Next about the inland waterways. The rivers are being developed into national waterways, like National Waterway 1 which is from Ganga to Bahirati to Hooghly and National Waterway 2 which is on Brahmaputra and these National Waterways provide cheaper and eco-friendly ways to move goods from markets to ports. In addition to this, multimodal logistic parks are being integrated with the ports. So this logistic parks will combine the road transport with the rail and waterways for a seamless cargo handling. So these are multimodal logistic parks. Now looking at India's shipbuilding vision, India ranks 12th in global level in shipbuilding. It only contributes for 1% of global ship market. The major shipyards in India are Masagon Dock Shipbuilders in Mumbai, Cochin Shipyard in Kerala, Hindustan Shipyard in Vishakhapatinam. So these are some of the major shipyards in India. By 2030, India aims to enter the top 10 shipbuilding nations and it aims to reach top 5 by 2047. So this is a part of Atmanirbar Bharat vision. So this is a future goal of India's shipbuilding industry. India also aims to increase the export of commercial ships and defense vehicles. Now let us see some of the key measures taken to achieve this goal. Government provides subsidies to shipyards under shipbuilding financial assistance policy until 2030. There is also a major focus on green shipbuilding technologies to build green efficient and eco-friendly ships. Also, the indigenous protection of warship and submarines is being prioritized to reduce the dependency on imports. There is also collaboration with the private players to modernize the shipyards and attract the international clients. Infrastructure also needs upgradation, building more dry docks and specialized berth for ship repair and construction will also help in achieving India's goal of becoming a leading shipbuilder. India envisions a free, open, inclusive and secure maritime network. So this is evident from Prime Minister Modi's speech in recent event. So India aims for strengthening the rule-based maritime order in Indian Ocean and Indo-Pacific region. In order to achieve this aim, there should be strict adherence to United Nations Convention on Law of the Sea for resolving maritime disputes peacefully. We should also ensure the freedom of navigation and fly to our international waters. India is also collaborating with the Quad nations like India, US, Japan and Australia to promote the maritime security and economic growth in Indo-Pacific region. Efforts like Indian Ocean Rim Association, Asian Regional Forum are taking place in this regard. India is also working with Indian Ocean Naval Symposium for stronger naval cooperation. India needs to combat the illegal activities like illegal fishing, piracy and maritime terrorism. The Information Fusion Center for Indian Ocean Region is using technologies like satellites, drones and artificial intelligence to monitor the Indian Ocean region effectively. AI-based tracking systems and satellites are also used for real-time ship monitoring and surveillance. There is also enhanced disaster response mechanism to tackle climate-related risk like cyclone and tsunamis. India is also promoting the blue economy which balances marine resource use with 
environmental conservation supporting biodiversity conservation and implementing strategies in order to adapt with the climate change is also crucial in this regard india should also encourage sustainable fishing and maritime tourism to benefit the coastal communities so india's maritime mission combines infrastructure modernization shipbuilding innovation and a commitment to rule based maritime order so these efforts aim to establish india as a leader in global maritime affairs by 2047 so this is all about the discussion now look at the prelims practice question arrange the following islands and archipelagos located in indian ocean from west to east seychelles lakshadweep andaman islands chagos archipelago madagascar so madagascar comes first then seychelles then lakshadweep then chagos archipelago and the far east is andaman islands so this is arrangement from west to east so the correct answer is option a with this let us conclude the discussion now look at this article the article highlights the potential of gm crops in india so gm crops can address hunger and improve the food security so thereby it increases the productivity but there are concerns regarding the herbicide resistance the environmental impact and high regulation cost regarding the gm crops so the article discusses these things now in our discussion let us discuss what are the basics of gm crops the pros and cons of gm crops and what are the gm crops introduced in india firstly what is a gm crop see the plants whose genes have been altered using biotechnology are called gm crops so this gives them a specific beneficial trait for example bt cotton was introduced in india and it contains a gene from bacillus thuringiensis bacteria so this gene from this bacterium makes the bt cotton resistant to bollworms which is a major pest for cotton crops so by introducing the genes from bacterium into a cotton crop reduces the need for chemical pesticides thereby it increases the yield of the cotton crops now in india the body which approves the gm crops for commercial use is genetic engineering appraisal committee this genetic engineering appraisal committee functions under ministry of environment forest and climate change and it is a statutory committee established under environment protection act 1986 so this is an important thing please note that now let us discuss about the advantages of gm crops firstly it helps the farmers to grow more food on the less land the farmers who are growing gm cotton have reported 20 percentage increase in profits due to better yield the gm crops are also drought resistant they can grow in better the gm crops are also drought resistant they can grow in dry conditions for example gm maize was designed to survive in water scarce regions but gm maize was not yet approved in india next about the pest resistance it reduces the need for harmful pesticides so gm crops especially doesn't need pesticides because they are resistant towards the pest for example the bt brinjal resist pests thereby reducing the use of pesticides in the cultivation gm crops can be stored for very long time and it stays fresh for example the gm tomato it has a very longer shelf life period next about gm papaya which has resistance to diseases most of the gm crops are resistant to particular diseases which affects them This GM papaya was introduced in Hawaii and it is resistant to papaya ring spot virus. So thereby it saves the papaya industry in Hawaii. So these are some of the important advantages of GM crops. Now let us discuss the disadvantages. One of the major disadvantage of GM crop is the high cost of seeds and dependence on biotechnology companies. Small farmers often face financial strain due to expensive GM seeds. GM crops may also harm the beneficial organisms. There are concerns that GM crops might negatively affect the pollinators like bees and butterflies. There is also a lack of long-term data on GM crops and its function in the nature. So insufficient studies on long-term health and environmental impacts of GM foods are yet to be studied. In India, the approval for GM mustard has been delayed due to the lack of conclusive biodiversity studies. So the lack of long-term data regarding the impact of GM crops is also a major concern. There are also ethical concerns regarding the introduction of GM crops. Altering the natural genes raises ethical debates about interfering with the nature. Many critics argue that GM mustard could threaten India's rich mustard diversity. Lastly about the super weed and super pest. GM crops are designed to resist the pest, but over time the pest and weeds adapt to for the GM crops. So they become resistant to the GM traits. For example in US the herbicide tolerant crops led to the growth of super weeds which attack the GM crops. So this super weeds require very stronger chemicals and it might affect the human health who consume these foods. So these are some of the important disadvantages regarding the GM crops. Now let us see what are the GM crops approved in India. There are two GM crops approved in India. One is BT cotton and another one is GM mustard. 
We have already seen about the GM cotton. Now let us discuss about the GM mustard. In October 2022, the Genetic Engineering Appraisal Committee approved the GM mustard for environmental release. But it faced opposition due to concerns about the biodiversity, health and the lack of local studies. So there is a lack of long term study about the health of ecosystem regarding the introduction of GM mustard. In 2024, this year July, Supreme Court issued a split verdict on its approval. So, Supreme Court approved the release of GM mustard. If you look at the benefits of GM mustard, it has higher yield, which means 20 to 35 percentage more yield than traditional varieties of mustard. So, this can reduce the oil imports of India. So, the oil from mustards can lower the edible oil imports of India from overseas. So, giving higher yield and thereby reducing the oil imports of India are important benefits of GM mustard. Now let us discuss a prelims practice question regarding this topic. With reference to genetically modified crops in India, consider the following statements. Genetic modification of crops involves introducing genes from other species to improve yield and resistance to pest. Yes, this is a general statement. It is correct. The Genetic Engineering Appraisal Committee is responsible for approving the commercial release of GM crops in India. Yes, GEAC is responsible for approving the GM crops in India and it functions under Ministry of Environment. So, this statement is also correct. So, the correct answer for this question is option C. With this, we have come to the end of the discussion. If you like the video, please share it with your friends and don't forget to subscribe to Shankaraya's Academy YouTube channel. Thank you for watching.